even the publicans love their own. What Jesus was trying to say to everybody, are you willing to take it past where you found it? Because see, if, 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 if a soldier comes to you and say, carry my gear one mile, and you say, you know what, I'm going to carry it two miles, you do something to that soldier. Because the soldier came to make you do it. But you say, I'm going to give you another one. And, and you say something different to that soldier. So if, 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 and, 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 and if I move on and say, if I only love my mother, you know, who loves me, my brother who loves me, my sister who loves me, but I love no one else, where is my reward? I'm not doing anything extra. And so hate does extra. And, and, and I'm going to get to it in just a minute. Let me, let me, let me get on down here with this, with this giving. There is what I call a circle of loop. Hank, you remember that document? It's what's got us in this mess that we're in in this country. The 1% is at the top, and they move on down through the uh, corporations, the PACs, the super PACs, the media, you know, the bought and paid for politicians, and then they get the voters, and no matter who wins, we still lose because the voters are going to vote for the R and the D, just like they re-elected Johnny Isaacson, and all the money comes right back to the 1%. But you know what? There's a way to defeat the circle of loop. It's called your circle of influence. And you see, hate has a circle of influence. And many of the things that, those of you that are familiar with me, many of the things that you have heard me say, you were hearing hate. Y'all know y'all don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to break it down. You, you remember that, that scripture where Jesus said, well, if you've seen me, if you know me, you know the Father. You know, he and I are one. You know, uh, the one said, you know, man shall leave his mother and father, they shall no longer be uh, twain, but one flesh. It's like operating in the same spirit. Our circle of influence, where we take what we know, and we willingly give, you know, one mile, go two, right? I'm not, not just going to love, you know, those that love me. I'm going to love everybody. I'm going to teach anybody that I come in contact with that don't know the truth. Just like Mike and Hank pulled me to the side and gave me an education. So, what is it that I say that you hear Hank, that, that, that Hank says, that, that you see in me that's Hank? Hank turned me on to the fair tax. Now I'm an expert. <laughs> it's my number one issue. I want to go back to 1913 before we became debt slaves. Hank talked me about the Federal Reserve. Had no real understanding, but Hank took the time to show me by the numbers. <clears throat> Hank taught me about the foreign policy and why we are in the shape that we are in in this country with regime change. And now, Hank is walking me through Donald Trump. Now, I ain't bought into it completely, but I told <laughs> Hank, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to watch. But Hank is the kind of man, and like I said, all of you that are here already know that, because you wouldn't be here if you didn't. And this is not for you. This is for those folk out there that's going to hear this afterwards, because you see what? I'm trying to take it past where I found it. See, Hank took it past where he found it when he gave it to me. So you people already have it, so I'm preaching to the choir. So the reason I'm sending this out there in Facebook world, I'm trying to take Hank past where I found him. If you take the time to listen and understand what this man is talking about, you will learn something. If you have a question and you send it to him, he will take the time and go research it for himself and send it to him. I made a comment to him about Trump saying, oh, well, we can just print money. And I was completely turned off. And Hank said, hold on, let me get back with you. Next thing I know, I got two videos. And I watched them. Because you know what? I'm a sponge. You can't grow if you aren't willing to learn. Simple as that. So if you think you know it all and you've made up your mind and you got it all down pat, Trust me, you are dead because if you don't grow, you're like a rock. It's all about growing. It's all about taking it past where you found it. So when you hear this man get up here to speak tonight, 
I want you to understand that he gives earnestly. He gets it for himself. He takes it past where he has found it. And if he sees somebody that he knows is on the wrong path, he, like him and Mike did when I was there up there at that meeting, will come to you and they will sit you down and they will talk to you if you are willing to listen. And that's what it all comes down to. Who's willing to listen to what thus said Mr. Hank? Mm. Well, I didn't know I was getting into that. All I wanted to do was see if I could get a little bit of credibility up here. <laughs> but I appreciate that very much. I, I was told before I got going here that I need to come up with some new jokes. Well, I just flew in from coming in board. My arm's tired. <laughs> you know, the airport fly in. You know. It is difficult to get here from coming. I don't know if you know that. I can get to Alabama before I get to, to Lawrenceville, starting from coming. I guess you guys probably live in Lawrenceville. No. So what'd you leave about noon <laughs> just to get over here? Okay, that's it for the joke. All right, thank you very much, Derek. I appreciate that very much. That is, that is, uh, and I got to tell you that what you're going to see tonight is the offspring of our conversation. See, this is how I grow when people challenge me for what I say and what I'm telling them. They challenge me. That just makes me dig that much deeper and it created this entire program up here just because I had a, a Facebook uh, uh, comfort not comfort but a Facebook message back and forth with with Derek uh, probably a couple of weeks or so ago he went he asked me about Donald Trump and <coughs> and, uh, and and here's the deal I got into this public speaking thing kind of on uh, a practically a day I came to a tea party meeting one night over and coming, and I had no idea who the speaker was. The speaker was up there talking about fiscal responsibility, limited size of government, and free markets. And when I got done with that, when, when she got done with that, I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, look, you can't have free markets if you don't own your own money. And you have to compete with the people who do own the money. That's not a free market and it's designed into the system. That entity who owns the money is the Federal Reserve System. And I challenged her, I said, why are you not talking about this? And Jenny Beth Martin told me, with people out there in the audience, that they had to dumb down the message so people could understand it. Well, that just lit a fire under me. Next thing I know, I'm putting together a program to try to explain to people what the Federal Reserve is, how it operates, and how it's impoverishing the American people. That's all of us. We're talking about the middle class. That's what that is. And so I started on a mission to try to educate as many people as I possibly could about what I had learned over the past several years. And every time I would put together a new program, I learned more. And that's the challenge that we all need to, to go after and to try to keep learning more and challenge yourself. And, and, and take this message to, the, to your neighbor. And when the neighbor doesn't believe you, then act, act like that's a challenge. Then dig back into everything I'm telling you here tonight, and then, first of all, research and make sure I'm not telling you something that's not right. And then secondly, take this information and broadcast it to the neighbors. Especially folks who are in the political realm, who, who come in contact with all of the people that we come in contact with daily. Networking is the best way that I have been able to determine to try to get this message out. I came and spoke to the Lanier Tea Party Patriots one night. Next thing you know, they want me to be their president. Well, see, it goes everywhere I go. Next thing you know, they want me over here. Not that. So, at any rate, this presentation, like I said, is, is an offspring of a conversation I was having with Derek, where back in April, Donald Trump uttered a few remarks that I've been waiting to hear someone say for the longest time, someone who has the means to carry this out. Because a lot of people say it. I can say it all day long, 
but I'm not Donald Trump. So when he says these things, my ears perk up. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, okay, we have a chance to fix this problem. Because, folks, i got to tell you, the destruction of this country is being paid for by money being printed out of the air. If you go to demo a house, the house doesn't come out on its own. Even though you're going to destroy something, that house has to be paid to be destroyed. It takes money to destroy something. There's a conscious effort to try to destroy this country, everything that it means, and bring it back up as a homogeneous group of people who don't know anything and then just go to work for the people who are in charge. That's all they're wanting to do. All, the, all of this, people coming across the border, all it is is attempt to homogenize the American people so we can lose what it means to be an American. That's all that is. If they can do that and, and make you and make the next generations forget what it means to be an American and forget what it means to be free, then they have won. So we have to keep pushing back. But they own the money. And they're the ones, that's why Doug Collins just ended up with 62% with of the vote up there with four challengers because he had a million and a half dollars to just throw at it. Well, we don't have that. We're just people. We can't do that. So when Donald Trump said these things, it got me thinking, and then when I was talking with Derek, then it got me thinking too, and I thought, well, I'm going to put together a presentation on this and explain to people exactly how you go about to pay off the national debt. He says he can do it in eight years. I agree. But you have to make some subtle changes in the way that our money is being issued. That's all it is. That's all it is. All right. So the video that Derek watched, I've incorporated it into a 12-minute video with, uh, and, and patched it together in such a way as to very quickly get you guys up to a different level. Because the people in this video are going to be telling you things that you don't know or probably didn't know when you walked in the door. Now all of a sudden, that's going to get us up, ramped up to where I can then answer any questions that may come to your mind because they're going to say some terms that you might not understand. But I'm going to go through that and I'm going to repeat those things that are vitally important for you to understand as well. So as we go through this, then just know, don't get bogged down if they say something that you don't understand because I'm going to cover it. Just keep listening to it and, and get your mind set for it. All right. Can you hold one second? Sure. Can we turn those blinds shut down a little bit? I can't even see it. Can those, are there any blinds over there? Uh, well, the blinds are coming in over here on this uh, side, this unfortunately. Well, that's where it is over there. Okay. Yeah, hopefully that'll, it'll, hopefully it'll get better with time, but you can hear it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and really that's a lot of it is just listening. Okay. okay. We can buy back government debt at a discount. In other words, if interest rates go up and we can buy bonds back at a discount, if we are liquid enough as a country, we should do that. In other words, we can buy back debt at a discount. People said, I want to go and buy debt and default on debt. and I'm, I mean, these people are crazy. This is the United States government. First of all, you never have to default because you print the money. I hate to tell you, okay? So there's never a default. $59,748. For every man, woman, and child in America, their share of the national debt. It's a $19 trillion pile of bills. Debt that the GOP frontrunner Donald Trump says he could pay off in eight short years. It's a magical mystery tour of math. Here's why that math doesn't add up. Eliminating the national debt in eight years would mean first balancing the budget, need Congress for that good luck. Then you'd have to pay down $2.3 trillion a year. The entire amount the government is spending this year, just less than $4 trillion. Trump claims he could do it by negotiating trade deals. Something economists say could have disastrous consequences if it starts a trade war with countries like China and Mexico. Trade wars cause recessions, lost jobs, and higher deficits when tax revenue plunges. Complicating Trump's sensational claims he wants to cut taxes for everyone. I'm giving this to you so that you can see what the typical viewpoint fact, of Donald Trump's course, remarks Donald Trump's has been. Tax plans would balloon the deficit and the national debt. How would the country pay for all that? More debt. 
when I put words on the screen, those are words to remember. What do you think about Donald Trump's plan of cutting the debt by making bondholders of treasury bonds take a hit? Well, actually, that's not what he said. What he said, because he was talking about open market purchase. He was talking about doing a swap. So he's saying where tr debt is trading for a discount and you can swap. He's basically talking about re-engineering, but it's, it's nothing that would default or, ah, okay. or, or be involuntary to a creditor. He's talking about where you can refund e fees or make open market swaps and purchases. In fact, Donald Trump is exactly the person to figure out, because what we need is not a debt swap, we need a debt for equity swap. The whole planet needs a debt for equity swap. So, so literally, so, so rather than re-engineer the debt, what we need to do is re-engineer the relationship between debt and equity and go to a much more equity-based system. So how could Donald Trump pay off the national debt in just eight short years, as he promised to do during his interview with the Washington Post last Thursday? To understand how to make this dramatic change safely and effectively, first you have to understand what the national debt is. When Congress wants to spend more money than it has in income, that's called a budget deficit. So let's say that in 2015 the budget passed by Congress was $4 trillion, but the national income, the total revenue, was only $3.5 trillion. So that creates a $500 billion budget deficit. So where does the nation get the extra money? The Treasury has to borrow it. These various Treasury securities pile up the national debt. Here is our current national debt to the penny, $19,264,938,619,643.07 as of March 31st, last Tuesday. Hopefully your head is not spinning yet with all these numbers, but here is the last one. How much interest are we actually paying on all this borrowing? Well, it varies wildly from year to year, but here are the last five years. It has varied from about $360 billion to $454 billion. That's almost as much as we spend on the entire Department of Defense. It's as much as we currently spend on education, Medicare and health, veterans benefits, HUD, international affairs, energy and environment, science, social security, unemployment and labor, transportation, and food and agriculture. Since interest rates can't go any lower, it's fair to say that interest rates have to move higher at some point. And that means that the best case scenario for the future is that the national debt will double every five to seven years unless something is done. Obviously, this is not sustainable. There's only one way to tackle this problem. Get out of this debt money system where banks create all the money in the system by having the outrageous privilege of lending money they do not have. It's not a new concept. To economic historians, it's known as a bank money system. Bank money systems tend to breed an oligarchy, as most of the big money is naturally sucked up by the banking system. The opposite of a bank money system is a state money system. State money is money created by the Treasury for the benefit of all citizens equally, not favoring one class, the banking class. Therefore, a state money system tends to reduce the amount of money the banking class accumulates and creates a more wealthy middle class because the politicians pay less attention to bankers and more attention to us, we the people. It's probably no surprise to you, but most people think that we already have a state money system, and they are horrified when they actually learn that banks create all of our money at interest. Did you know that? A state money system then sells the nation's money to the banking class to lend out to us. It doesn't kill the banks. It just creates real competition between them. President John Adams considered any private issue of money a monstrosity and a fraud on the public. He was right. In the mid-1930s, at the depths of the Great Depression, a group of American professors of economics tried to persuade President Franklin D. Roosevelt to adopt the state money system to get out of the Depression. Leading this group was Irving Fisher, Professor Emeritus of Economics at Yale University, one of the most respected economists in the world. 
As he put it in his classic little book, 100% Money and the Public Debt, published in 1936, nationalize money, but do not nationalize banking. In fact, the present demand to nationalize banking would fade away if only the control of money were recaptured by government. Almost all of our complicated banking laws could be repealed if we made this separation between money creation and money lending. The insurance of bank deposits would become unnecessary because there would be no reasons for runs on banks. So, how would we make the transition in today's world? It's really pretty simple. Remember how the debt is purchased by buying treasury notes and bonds and other securities? As these securities come due, instead of Treasury repaying them with these Federal Reserve notes, simply pay them off with this older form of state money, old U.S. notes. U.S. notes have the red seal. Federal Reserve notes have a green seal. U.S. notes were legal tender in the United States from 1862 to 1994. That's 132 years. It's the longest serving form of American money. Federal Reserve notes are part of the bank money system. U.S. notes are issued free of debt from the Treasury of the United States. Other than the color of the seal, they look exactly the same, but one increases the national debt, the other does not. The good news for incoming President Trump is that about 48% of the national debt is sold as treasury bills or treasury notes with a maturity of three years or less. What does that mean? It means that once you start repaying the treasury bills and notes with U.S. notes instead of Federal Reserve notes, it immediately starts to reduce the national debt. It's not inflationary because you aren't increasing the money supply, because you're just replacing bank money with state money on a one-for-one -one basis. The total money supply remains the same. It remains stable. Therefore, the state money switchover will not cause inflation. So within three years, President Trump will have paid off about 50% of the national debt held by the public. Mr. Trump said he could pay off all of the publicly held national debt within eight years, but that doesn't take into account the 10-year Treasury notes and 30-year Treasury bonds still floating around out there. However, just starting to reduce the debt starts reducing the wildly growing interest payments. It's real money the U.S. can put to good use elsewhere in the economy. Now, if President Trump can boost the U.S. economy in other ways, through better trade deals, etc., that will all add up to a dramatic increase in our GDP and the first significant decrease in our national debt since President Andrew Jackson last paid off the national debt in 1836. And with all that new prosperity, perhaps President Trump could offer the holders of these long bonds a special deal, extra interest to retire them early so he could keep his promise to the American people. If we can buy back government debt at a discount, in other words, if interest rates go up and we can buy bonds back at a discount, if we are liquid enough as a country, we should do that. In other words, we can buy back debt at a discount. People said, I want to go and buy debt and default on debt. And Liquidity is and these people are crazy. Here. This is the United States government. First of all, you never have to default because you print the money. I hate to tell you, okay? So there's no default. The United States what we need is not a debt money. swap. We need a debt for equity swap. The whole planet needs a debt for equity swap. So, so literally, so, so rather than re-engineer the debt, what we need to do is re-engineer the relationship between debt and equity and go to a much more equity-based system. Is that crazy and reckless what he wants to do? In your opinion, and you can handle big, big, big money. What he's talking about is the truth. In other words, we are in no risk of default because we can print money. If you could print, you know, if you could denominate all the money you borrow for your house or your credit card in currency that you could print off your printer, there's no risk of default. So rather than re-engineer the debt, what we need to do is re-engineer the relationship between debt and equity and go to a much more equity-based system. There's the rub. This is dangerous territory for anyone to try. But Donald Trump is making an attempt at doing this. All right.
So there's a lot in there. You don't have to know it all. But I think that right now, if you were listening, you're up on a different plane than you were when you walked through the door. And I'm going to take what they said, and I'm going to do some explaining on how they would go about this. First of all, she said, what we need is a debt for equity swap. She said, the whole world needs a debt for equity swap. That's exactly right, because the same system, the same debt-based system, the same bank money system is operating all over the world. Don't believe me? Take a look at here. This is worldwide sovereign debt. At the very top, right there, that's the United States, $19 trillion. Right underneath us, the United Kingdom at, I think it's uh, $9.7 trillion. And go down this list of, of different countries here, and each one of them shows you how much debt they're in. But here's the deal. That's not all. Here's another 40. And that's not all. Here's another 40. And another 40. And another 40. You see, these countries are really not sovereign. The United States of America is really not sovereign because if it was, then we wouldn't have a debt problem like this. These, these countries are part, they work inside a banking cartel, a worldwide banking cartel. These are different bank, banking organizations like the Federal Reserve, like the ECB, like the Japanese Central Bank, but they are all interconnected into a network. And this network owns the money that all these countries use. And these countries, the, both the people and the, the, the national governments, have to borrow it in order to operate. Now this 19 trillion that you saw from, for our national debt, that's just a portion of our national debt if, you, if you're thinking about uh, what the total debt for the entire country is. Because I'm just gonna call it 20 trillion. 20 trillion is, a, is our government's national debt, but another 45 trillion is what we owe and what the American people owe. So that's a combined total of 65 trillion dollars. And when I show you these numbers in here and show you how, they're, how they vary with the two different systems, you're going to understand how that, that, even that can be paid off with a different system here. All right, this is the debt money system that she's talking about, I, or that, that she's talking about and that Bill Still is talking about. The bank money system. I, I call it, bank money is good. I, I don't use the state money uh, term. I use sovereign money because it's the people's money when, it's, when the government is creating it. But let's go through this. Under the Federal Reserve System and all these central banking systems, the money is printed out of the air by the Federal Reserve member banks and then it's loaned to the people. Then the people pay, it, pay the loan back to the Fed member banks and then the, the dollars go back into the air. So the, it's like, think about the water entering Lake Lanier. It comes from the air. It goes into Lake Lanier. If it sat there, eventually it would all go back into the air again because it's all evaporating. That's why they call it currency, current, it's all related, liquidity, it's all related to, to this same uh, idea. So it's like ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If you loan a dollar into existence, then when you pay the dollar back off, it goes out of existence. That's the system we're operating on, under. The problem is, the banks don't print the money to pay the interest. So where are you gonna get the money to pay the interest? All they do is print the principal. So what do you have to do? You have to borrow more principal. So down here, you, you'd have a, a duplicate set, just a little bit smaller numbers, say right in here, just to borrow more principal to buy, pay the interest on the principal that you already borrowed. And then you just did it again, so you gotta have another one down here, so you have a perpetual debt machine. And there's no way to pay it off because they don't print enough money to pay it off. You're gonna be astonished when you see the actual figures that I'm gonna show you. So this is your debt-based economic model. Now this is, very, this is very easy for me to explain how this works. See a credit card in your pocket? When you pay your bill tonight with a credit card, do you know that you're creating money? That money doesn't exist until you go and pay, until they take that credit card and they swipe it, all of a sudden that money comes into existence and it goes into their account and then it leaves you with a liability. You've got to pay it back. 
but it didn't exist when you walked through the door. That's how the system works. So when you get your bill, and, you, and you're fortunate enough to be able to pay it at the end of the month, then all they did was they took, they made you pay more for it by about 3% because the, an establishment like this has to charge more for people who are going to use credit cards because that 3% is taken out of their check. So this is how all of the money is created. It's created, it's borrowed into existence. All right, now this is an asset-based economic system. Now, to see the system, if you're gonna start a system up here, you've got to print some money out of the air. And it, but instead of going to private banking institutions, it goes to the government. The government, the US Treasury Department. Now here, there's two different ways it can go. Either that money is printed in order to pay the cost of government, rather than, say, taxing, they just print the money to pay the cost of government. And then that money gets paid into the economy. And so you have an increase in liquidity in this system. The other system, you always have a decrease in liquidity because you always have to borrow more to pay the interest, but they don't pay the interest. So you're always having to borrow more just to keep that system going, which is the system we're operating under. This, however, this is a, a completely different thing. This is a liquid manufacturing system. The other one is illiquidity manufacturing. So here it is. We have government prints the money out of the air. It's paid to the people in the form of checks to pay the cost of government. And it flows down this way because it's not removed. See, there's no air. It doesn't go back to the air here. It's not removed. The people have money to save and invest. It stays in the economy. They, ha they can save and invest that money. What's the biggest problem we have with, with uh, trying to, to, to say retire? These days, you, there's, there's no money to save and invest. And if you do have money, you know, if you're on a fixed income, you can't get any interest for it because they're stealing the interest from you. <laughs> it's, all, it's all part of the same model here. Now, part of this, though, gets paid into a, nation, into a banking system, a private banking system. Banks have to actually compete for your business. They actually have to use good, sound business practices in order to stay in business. They have to... To, to loan to people who can pay the money back because they're going to be borrowing money from the U.S. Treasury. They're also going to be building up their reserves. They're going to be building up their capitalization when they do that. But they're going to be borrowing from the U.S. Treasury. But when it gets paid back, rather than going to the uh, paid back and in, 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 uh, going back into the air, that money goes to the back to the government treasury. And guess what? It helps to pay the cost of government. That's what this system does. It's no coincidence that in 1913, the first thing they did was they, in, they enacted the income tax. Excuse me. The first thing that they did, yes, they, they enacted the income tax, the 16th Amendment, to allow them to tax the people because then the very next thing they did was they brought in the Federal Reserve. They knew that was going to happen and they had to have a way to be able to pay the cost of government because they were about to take that, that means away. The, the government is supposed to be working in, in its perpetual uh, asset-based monetary system to where there's times where it just has to put on a little bit of gas if, you, if you're running out of liquidity, then the government can put some more liquidity into the system. But you need more money to pay for a growing economy. Now, this has a feedback loop. So the other system started off in the air, went through the system, and then left back into the air. This one does not. The dollars, these are assets. These are not liabilities. They're entering into the system as real assets. That dollar doesn't have to be paid back. It, it just stays in the system and it grows with the economy. And that's what happens right here. So where you might have a taxing system, whether it's the fair tax or whether it's just excise taxes like they used to have before the Federal Reserve came in, they had a means to be able to get the people or the states to be able to contribute to the cost of the government. And that's what this does. It also allows the, the private banking system to then pay interest back to the government to pay the cost of government. So in here, in this system, you don't need a federal, you don't need an IRS. You don't need a, a, an income tax. This system is somewhat self-supporting, and that's why we didn't have that prior to 1913. So the money to pay the interest is already printed because the money never leaves then the money, unless the, unless the Treasury wanted to remove something, they could do it. But other than that, 
The money to pay interest on these loans here, it comes from savings and investment. You can save up to buy a car. Well, you can pay for part of the car, but you can't pay for all of the car. So you take some of your savings and you buy the car, and then you also borrow a little bit. But you're not borrowing. I heard today that today on Bloomberg, they said that the, the median purchase price of a new vehicle in this country is $30,000 and it's taking 68 months to pay it back at 0% interest. 68 months, they're, they're spreading them out because the liquidity in this country is going down. They're having to do that in order to keep the business going. So this is your asset-based economic model. This is, this is the, the economic model of your founding fathers right here. This is what, what Jefferson was talking about. This is what we're going to talk about with, with George Washington is talking about. This is, what, uh, this is why uh, uh, John Adams said what he did in that video. All right. Now let's go to the U.S. Constitution, because I'm going to show you that the system we're operating violates the intent of the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 is that area, is that area of the Constitution that authority enters in the federal government. If the Congress, which is covered by Article 1, did not make the first law, then the President would have no laws to execute. And the Supreme Court would have no laws to interpret. So the laws, the authority for the federal government to act at all enters through these 18 enumerated powers in the U.S. Constitution. One of those is the power to borrow money on the credit of the United States. Now, I don't know why this was first before the other ones, but it does make sense that, that they wanted to create some means of flexibility to finance the government. Secondly, to coin money. This is to manufacture money. This is not just, you know, making dimes and quarters. This is, this is a sovereign money system. This is the, the U.S. Treasury. The U.S. Treasury was created in, eight, in 1789. That was like the first thing that they did after they ratified the Constitution and set up a government. They set up the U.S. Treasury. And then the last thing it says about money is the power to punish counterfeiting. Now, that means that the money was the people's money. Because if it was private money, and there, that's not counterfeiting, that's fraud. Counterfeiting is, is, is creating a, a, a light, likeness of something that the government owns. It's not creating a likeness of something that's privately owned. That is a civil suit or that is a criminal suit, but it's not counterfeiting and it's not something covered under the U.S. Constitution. So the, the system that we're operating right here is defying all these as we'll see it. Now George Washington said in his farewell address, if you want to know what the U.S. Constitution means in a lot of ways, you can go to George Washington's farewell address because he wrote this and published this after eight years serving as our first president under the U.S. Constitution. So if anybody had a pretty good idea of what the U.S. Constitution meant, it would have been George after eight years sitting in that position. He said about debt, this is what he said, a very important source of strength and security. Cherish public credit. Cherish it. It means like take it. It's like a fine wine. You just put it away. You don't use it up. You just put it away. You cherish it. You have it. You can look at it. It's like a, it's like a great... Uh, a great car that you've restored. You don't just go out there and run it all over the road. You just, you cherish it. You put it away. And then you only use it when you, when you really need to. One method of preserving it is to use it as sparingly as possible. Well, that only kind of makes sense. You know, if you, if you don't use your credit, then, then you're not going to abuse it. Avoiding occasions of expense by cultivating peace. He talks about peace and wars in this. And he's, the, that, that the violation of, of the principle of cultivating peace is going to re result in wars. He calls them unavoidable wars down here. That, to George Washington, was really the only reason why you'd ever have to borrow. And when you borrow, you're going to be borrowing back money from the people because you're protecting the people. The people are the ones that, you, that the government is supposed to protect. That's, what, that's, that's really the purpose of government. So the people have got to ante in in order to... to uh, had their own protection for, from the federal government. It says, but remembering also that timely disbursements to prepare for danger frequently prevent much greater disbursements to repel it. 
uh, of course, this is not unique to, to uh, Donald Trump, but one of the things he says that he's, he wants to build up the United States military to the extent that no one will even question, no one will ever try to test our resolve. Well, that's what George Washington is saying. Whether, uh, granted, I don't think that Donald Trump has ever read the Farewell Address. I don't know. But this is just such a sound principle that anyone who's thinking about it is also going to understand that. He says, likewise, it says, uh, prepare for danger, frequently prevent much greater disbursements to repel it. So if you don't prepare for it, then you're going to have to do like what we, what we did in World War II. We had to quickly mobilize and be able to, to throw a lot of money at creating all of the assets we needed to, to fight that war. Avoiding likewise the accumulation of debt. Not only by shunning occasions of expense, in other words, the government should keep expenses low but by vigorous exertions in time of peace to discharge the debts which unavoidable wars may have occasioned, not ungenerously throwing upon posterity the burdens which we ourselves ought to bear. Every generation should pay its own freight. That's one of the principles that he's talking about here. But he's saying that wars is a legitimate reason why the government may have to borrow. But that's really it. Just, just to pay for wars. Now let's go back to the U.S. Constitution for these, these three areas in here and see how the, these have been violated by the way that we're operating. This is, what the, this is the same slide that you looked at. The Congress will have the power to borrow money, coin money, and punish counterfeiting. So what has the Congress chosen instead to do? The Congress has chosen to borrow money on the credit of the United States and pay the entire cost of government and support the entire American economy. That's the problem. That, in a nutshell, is the entire problem. That is why we are fiscally unsound. That is why we keep having to build the government because we keep having to, have to borrow more money to pay the interest on the money we already borrowed. So you've got to have a growing government in order to support that. And if you ever tried to balance the budget under this present system, you would bankrupt the economy because it would run out of money. <laughs> you've got to keep borrowing it and flooding it into the economy just to give the people enough money to operate on. They chose not to coin money. Now, we, we got dimes and quarters and stuff like that, but we're not talking about any appreciable amount of money. They've chosen not to coin money, not to manufacture our own money, and instead use the money that's borrowed from a private source in order to fund not only the government, but the entire, the entire uh, U.S. economy. Yes, Derek? Just a quick question. Uh, so you're saying... If we were to get a balanced budget amendment, it would be worthless under our current system? It would, it would create a depression overnight because there would be no way to borrow new money to pay the interest on the old money. And the people who really don't want that are the bankers. If you'll remember, remember the last time that, that uh, they, they, the Republicans shut down the government and, uh, and they, they, the uh, veterans were not allowed to go to the World War II Memorial and all that, and they, they marched up there and they threw all that stuff off. Well, yeah, I know. well do you, you might also recall that, that Obama would not talk to the Republicans. Remember that? You know who you're talking to? You know who he's locked up in the Oval Office with? Exactly. He was locked up there with Jamie Di Diamond, uh, the CEO of, of uh, uh, Chase Manhattan, uh, and Goldman Sachs, they're all sitting in there because they're the guys that if, that if they don't, if we don't start the money borrowing back up, then they're the guys who are going to have a real problem. They're going to have the liquidity problem because the money has got to be flooding the economy in order for them to get the interest on their payments. And the last thing is we've chosen to reward counterfeiting. Now we're supposed to be operating a sovereign money system here. We're not. And what did they do? You already saw it in, in the uh, previous a video. Here it is, the Federal Reserve note. Now this came after the U.S. note. U.S. note, this is how Lincoln financed the Civil War. He got into this, he said, what are we going to do? Well, we can borrow money, but that doesn't make any sense because the Bank of England has always been wanting to, to lend us money. The last thing that happened when he, when he talked about 1836, the last time we balanced the budget, that was the year that, that um, uh, Andrew Jackson he was leaving office, and that was the year he vetoed the bill that would have been a recharter for the second 
uh, Bank of the United States, which was really owned by the Bank of England. So he said no more, and that he killed the bank. I think that's on his tombstone. Well, these, this is counterfeit right here. I'll bet you well over 50% of the people walking into this room thought that these dollars were owned by the federal government. Well, see, that's what they want you to believe. But it's counterfeit. I mean, uh, you can look in the, in, in, in the Bible. This is all. This is what the money changers in the temple do. <laughs> this is... This is what the father of all lies does. He makes you think that something is one way and it's really the other way. Well, this is real money right here. This is an asset. This is fake money. This is counterfeit. This is a liability. But they want you to make... We trade liabilities in order to buy things. Think about it this way. If you had your neighbor, Bill, he's got a lawnmower. He owns a lawnmower. But you don't have a lawnmower. You say, Bill, can I borrow your lawnmower? Yeah, sure you can. Well, he's also got a weed whacker. Your neighbor says, hey, hey, can I borrow your weed whacker? Yep, it's great. No problem. Just have it by, back by the end of the day. No problem at all. Halfway through the day, you're done with mowing the grass, but you need a weed whacker. So you go to your other neighbor and say, hey, look, you're done with that? I'll trade you this, this liability that I have for the liability that you have, and we'll both get our work done. That's what we have here. We're trading liabilities for assets. The asset is a nice yard. We're trading liabilities for asset, and it's it's... It is so rotten, it is so crooked, that, and it is, it is the way that our country is being destroyed. This is the back of it. Now, if you look on the Federal Reserve note, you're going to see all this Illuminati crap. This is the all-seeing eye, the pyramid, and everything. So they're telling you what they're doing. They're telling you what they're doing. But, you know, we're going to be looking at it forever, and, and it just really, you know, we just keep doing it. Now, this just says it's a dollar. That's all, we, all it has to say. Yes, sir? Back one slide. Sure. What does it say about one dollar on the U.S. note? Uh, on the U.S. note. Oh, in the U.S. note? Right above the one dollar bottom center. It says, "We'll pay to the bearer on demand one dollar." It's not silver. silver. No, there are silver certificates, silver certificates, and there are gold certificates too, and then and, and those would be payable back in silver. But this is, it just says it's going to pay a dollar. Well, there it is. <laughs> it's all just printed out of the air. All right. Now let's go with some of the things that Trump said here. And then I'm going to go pull some of the, extract some of the things that the two speakers said in the video. He said, if we are liquid enough as a country, we should buy back government bonds at a discount. Okay. I know that when you hear that first time, you go, ah, what's he talking about here? All right, I'm going to show you exactly what he's talking about. The liquidity of our country is going down and down and down and down because the system itself is bankrupt. I'm telling you something that you, it, it, it may be hard to swallow, but this system died in 2008. And they've been keeping it going by printing money. And I'm going to show you the, the figures here so that you'll be able to understand that. I'm just telling you the truth here. Just like Derek said, I don't lie to people. I'm just telling you the truth. All right. Look at this. I pulled this off this week from the Federal Reserve. You can go to the St. Louis Fed and you've got all kinds of in interesting information if you just want to look it up. And, and uh, this is the money velocity. Money velocity is a measure of how fast the money is changing hands in the economy. And so under a vibrant, growing economy, the money velocity is going to be increasing. If you have a growing economy, then people are they're buying more and more things with the money that they have. And but well, look at this. Since they've been keeping records in 1959, we're at the lowest lowest point ever. We're at the lowest point of money velocity right now. Well, this goes in hand in hand with all the other things I'm about to show you. Look here, student loans. We're oh my gosh, don't get me going on the student loans. But folks, this 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 um, lottery that we have. It's creating the conditions to where people have to borrow to, to pay for their higher education. When I, I, when I went through Georgia Tech, it was like $750 a quarter. Okay, that was a lot, but it was manageable. Then I went through Georgia State, I borrowed $4,000 to get a master's degree. $4,000 and I paid it back in 10 years at $50.90 a month. It was a lot, but not a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars this is a dead monster this 
this because all, all they're doing is they're going out and buying more facilities and creating more things to have to maintain at all these universities now. They're not colleges, they're not, not, they're not local um, colleges, they're all universities and they all have to support all that and that's bankrupting the people. Student loans, food stamps. Right now, if we didn't have electronic food stamp cards, then you'd have bread lines. You'd have soup lines. There's more people that are dependent upon the government for just basic food right now than at any time during the Depression. But we have these cards now. And every time they, they trip one of those cards, it creates money out of the air. And they have to keep it going. They have to keep more money going into the system in order to support the money, the, the, to pay the interest on the money that's already there. Can you say Cuba? Anyone, anyone has been concerned about Cuba, the real reason for that is that they're trying to create another market for currency so they can borrow more and more currency there, make it into a paradise, and have it paid back to the bankers. That's all that's about. Iran is not about nuclear weapons. It's all about currency. It's all about the control of the issuance of the currency and who has, has hegemony over the world markets with their currency. Federal debt keeps going up. Money printing. This is the only thing that's keeping the system going right here, is money printing. Either the Federal Reserve has been printing it outright, handing it to the Wall Street banks. The Wall Street banks for the longest time were just using it to bid up and, and entice people to buy into the markets. But one way or the other, it's this is the money. It, this is new money just being printed out of the air. And it's not even being borrowed by anybody. It's being set up as reserve because they're exchanging it for, for, for uh, mortgage-backed assets. Well, they're not even assets. They're just derivatives. They're, they're exchanging them for useless things, and we can't see their books because it's all part of the system. It's secret and it's criminal. Health insurance costs. We all know about that. Labor force participation. We've all been hearing that term, I think. Labor force participation rate is the lowest that it has been in... I don't know how long, but it's, it's lower, and notice it's going down. The workers share of the economy, this is a big deal for the middle class. The middle class is being impoverished by this system. This is a system of trickle-up poverty. You've heard of a trickle-down economics? Well, this is trickle-up poverty because it hurts the people at the lowest end, the, the first, and they're the ones that have to take out and, and go on food stamps. They're the ones that become totally dependent on the government, and that level of, of people see, increases as time goes by. Home ownership, they keep coming up with these different ways to, to loan more money into the economy. So even people that can't pay it back, they know they can't pay it back, but they gotta get the money in the economy in the first place. If they don't, they can't pay back the interest on all the money that's out there in the first place. So they keep doing that, but as they do it, it's counterproductive. Home ownership keeps going down because the people can't pay it. So now they're to the point where people are not even borrowing anymore. Even at zero percent interest, people are just not borrowing as they as they could. All right, this is the reason for diminished liquidity. The red area, that's dead. You know what a parabola is? A parabola is is a trigonometric uh, idea that that keeps going up and up and up and up. This is the power of compound interest. You never pay the principal down so the interest keeps building. And that's what this is. The power of compound interest. It can't go the other way. It cannot go the other way. That's why this system as it is under the Federal Reserve System, I, I've said this a hundred times when I'm talking to people, that under the Federal Reserve System it is mathematically impossible for America to become anything other than a nation completely encumbered in debt. That's it. And ultimately, that ends up in complete disaster. This number just keeps going down and it starts to approach vertical. That, there's no other way that, for this model to go. The, another reason for decreased liquidity is the value of the dollar itself. Over the last hundred years, it's devalued. It's now 5% of what it was in 1913. So they're devaluating the currency so it takes more dollars to buy the same thing that it took uh, that, that you could buy two years ago. It takes more dollars, so that's a liquidity aspect of this. All right, now this is the national debt clock. Everybody ever looked at the, the national debt clock? You know what I'm talking about there? If you go into it, it'll just sit there and trickle off the numbers here. You can see what all these numbers... So I just took a screenshot of this. Now that number was moving very quickly, 
very fast. It's all increasing. The number right there is moving uh, very rapidly too. The increased difference between total debt and currency of, available to pay it off. All right, under the system that we're on right now, this number right here, that $65 trillion I referred to uh, uh, earlier, that is combined, say, $20 trillion for the United States government and $45 trillion for the American people. That adds up to $65 trillion. Now, in the money supply, there's only $12.7 trillion. I'm not going to call it $13 trillion. So there's $13 trillion in the money supply. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. This is what you don't realize when you're looking at this. Every one of those $65 trillion was one at one time introduced into circulation. Think about that. Now there's only 13 left. Where did it go? See, so you, if you go to pay these back, it's going to take every, every one of these dollars to pay down that principal there. And by the time, every time you pay down that principal, then one of those dollars disappears. Remember, it goes from the air and then to the air. So if you pay that off, you'll be 50, $52 trillion will be left owed by the time you've used all the money that's in circulation to pay off the debt. you still got $52 trillion to pay off. That's what this system does. It bankrupts not only this country, but the entire world. Now, on the other side of that, Trump says, this is the United States government, direct quote. You never default because you print the money. Notice he did not say, this is the Federal Reserve. He did not say this is a private banking system. This is not a debt-based uh, system. This is the United States government. You never default because you print the money. Let's see what happens here if you start doing, doing the math the other way. What we're going to do is unwind this. That's what this would do. It's going to unwind it. So every time you pay off, say, let's just talk about the national debt, say $20 trillion. Every time you print a dollar out of the air that is the people's money, and you pay that off, then one of those original dollars goes away. One for one, for every dollar that you, of debt that you pay off, that dollar goes away, but you just put in a new dollar. So all of a sudden, you paid off principal, but you didn't lose any of your currency. So that number up here goes down, but that number stays the same. That's what Bill's, uh, uh, Bill um, still was saying. He's saying that you exchange the dollars one for one, and the, the money supply stays the same, so it's not inflationary. So that's the key here. Under the new asset-based system, the national debt will be paid off. It's just a matter of how quickly you actually take this project on. As the U.S. national debt is retired, the money supply is not affected. Less debt with the same currency available to pay it. That means more liquidity. Remember when Donald Trump said, if we're, if we're liquid as a country, then we can pay this down faster. Well, this is a liquidity machine. The other machine is an anti-liquidity machine. It's a starvation machine. It's a trickle-up poverty machine. This system injects liquidity in the system and it pays off the debt while you keep enough money in there to operate. The CNN lady, she says, how are you going to pay for all that more debt? Okay, that's the system. See, she's operating under the assumption of the Federal Reserve System. The only way to pay for the debt is to take on more debt. So she's right, but she doesn't understand that's not what Trump's talking about. He's talking about a whole different system. If you want to know why all the big Republicans are so up in arms and they weren't jumping on the Trump machines because they're all beneficiaries of the debt-based monetary system. They're the ones that get all the money, whenever they need it, to, into their coffers in order to, to seek re-election. That's why they don't want this. I sat in, let's see, everybody in the 7th District here? Well, we got ninth District over here. 7th District, Rob Woodall, your, your, your guy? Okay, well I sat in Rob Woodall's office for an hour. I'll bet you, by the time we're at this point right here, you guys are pretty well getting it. You're like, okay, I see what's going on here. Rob Woodall doesn't get it. I sat there for an hour, just him and me, and my laptop, going through this. He didn't get it. So I wonder if he don't want to get it. Either that, but, but he'll tell you that he can balance the budget 
on his laptop computer. He'll tell you that. So I wonder about it. I also did it with, with Doug Collins. I asked for an hour. I got a half hour. He had to go to a conference call. So that's what we're up against, folks. That's why all these guys got to go. That's why That's why. Why all these people who are, are, as Steve said, who are venturing out into the world to, to try to defeat these people, they owe it. We owe them our support. Whatever we can do, we've got to support anyone who will venture out there and try to put, take one of these guys out. Catherine Fitz says, what we need is not a debt swap, we need a debt for equity swap. We just went through that. That's what she said. That's what this means. We're, we're swapping a debt-based system for an asset-based system. We're paying off the debt-based. It's one thing to pay off a, a dollar of liability, but we're paying off an entire debt-based system with an asset-based system. I'm not going to go there. The world, the whole world needs a debt for equity swap to go to an equity-based system. Yes, now just imagine. Just imagine this. I'm, I'm dreaming right here. This has not happened, but I'm dreaming. Let's say Donald Trump is successful in doing this in the United States of America. Say, say he's not shot. Let's say that everything is, goes vanilla. What do you think the rest of the world is going to do? You see, the, the reason why they're in this system is because we put them in this system. The, the United States military has been enforcing this system all over the planet. There are several countries that do not operate in this system. One of them is Russia. One of them is Brazil. One of them is India, China, South Africa. Those are the BRICS countries. Do you know what just happened in Brazil? Have you been reading what's been going on in Brazil? Now, the BRICS countries are trying to come up with their own asset-based economic system and then try to lure the world into their asset-based economic system. Well, what's happened to Brazil? They, they just overthrew the government down there. I say they? It's no, it should not be any wonder what's going on down there. They're one of the BRICS countries. They are the B in the BRICS. Iran also runs a sovereign banking system. That's why we know that it's not about nuclear weapons, it's about currency and trying to get them to adopt back into the petrodollar system. Libya, they were trying, Muammar Gaddafi was trying to mobilize the entire continent of Africa to use a gold-backed currency for Africa, to where Federal Reserve couldn't just print money out of the air and buy oil anymore, or buy, oil, buy gold. They'd have to exchange gold any time that they were going to uh, trade with any of the countries in Africa. Well, what happened to him? See, this is what's operating worldwide. This is what's, what's making all of these geopolitical events happen, is the need for these private interests to keep their system going, and, to, and if they can just take over the entire planet, like if they get the TPP in, the TPIP, and TISA, those are the constitution of a worldwide government, a worldwide corporate government over the countries, over the nations. That is who would be in charge here. That's how this works. Bill still says, get out of this debt money system. The opposite of a bank money system is a state money system. State money is created by the treasury for the benefit of the citizens equally, not favoring one class. Yes, the, the asset-based system we're talking about is a system that is of, by, and for the people. The system we operate now is of, by, and for the bankers. They own the dollars in your pocket and you have to pay it back to them. Bill Steele says, banks create all of our money, money at interest. That's a foregone conclusion. At this point, you should understand that. He says, state money system sells the nation's money to the banking class, creates real competition between them. Exactly. The banks have to borrow from the people <laughs> rather than the people having to borrow from the banks. It completely turns that system around to where the banks are helping to fund the people's government with the interest. He says, U.S. notes are use, issued free of debt, replace bank money with state money on a one-by-one -one basis, will not cause inflation. We went through that. If, as you pay down the national debt, the, the dollars stay in circulation and they just keep paying it down. John Adams said, 
Bank money is a monstrosity and a fraud on the public. Now you understand why he said that. Our founding fathers, the entire War of 1812 was over this, was over banking. Remember, uh, uh, Jackson, uh, Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans and all that. Andrew Jackson became president and he's the one that shut, that finally shut down the, the uh, uh, Bank of England from their ownership of the Second Bank of the United States. But, so he killed the bank. I had something else I was going to say. Been talking a long time. All right, Thomas Jefferson, this is one of my favorite quotes. Thomas Jefferson said, if the American people allow private banks to control the issuance of the currency, which is exactly what we do, the banks and corporations, they're all in partnership. Just think about the healthcare industry. Just think about Obamacare. The banks and corporations that grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. That's exactly what is happening in our country. That is exactly what is happening all over this world. And if we don't stop it, then they will succeed. And we will be slaves. The process for paying off the national debt, very simply, until all national debt is paid off, the U.S. Treasury makes its interest and in bond payments by issuing U.S. notes just like Bill still said. The asset owned by the people pays off a liability owned by the govern government's creditors, canceling the debt. All issued U.S. notes remain in circulation. Only the U.S. Treasury can cancel them, removing them from circulation if they wanted to. If there was a reason to remove some of the circulation, they could do that. After the U.S. national debt is paid off, eventually all Federal Reserve notes in circulation will be paid off by U.S. notes because the Federal Reserve currency is issued as debt, a liability, rather than an asset. When that debt is paid off, it ceases to exist. Thus, the asset of equivalent value, the U.S. note received in exchange for the debt, the Federal Reserve note, cancels the debt. Paid off, the paid off Federal Reserve note becomes canceled and is removed from circulation. So we're going... It's a matter of transition. This is how they installed the Federal Reserve System. We had the, the, the asset-based system prior to this. So they just started paying the bills using Federal Reserve currency rather than it was borrowed from the bankers rather than our own currency. All right. The, eventually, all debt-based currency is replaced by equity-based currency. I'm going to play this real quick. This is, this is now that... You've heard everything that I've said, and I know it's getting late, but I want you to hear what Donald Trump says now that you've had a chance to digest what all that meant. We can buy back government debt at a discount. In other words, if interest rates go up and we can buy bonds back at a discount, if we are liquid enough as a country, we should do that. That's In other words, we can buy back debt at a discount. People said, I want to go and buy debt and default on debt, and I'm, I mean, these people are crazy. This is the United States government. First of all, you never have to default because you print the money. I hate to tell you, okay? So there's never a default. So what we need is not a debt swap. We need a debt for equity swap. The whole planet needs a debt for equity swap. So, so literally, so, so rather than re-engineer the debt, what we need to do is re-engineer the relationship between debt and equity and go to a much more equity-based system. She just said much more equity-based system. So part of it is debt. Because we do have a banking system that would loan into the economy, but that banking system takes loans also from the U.S. Treasury and then pays the cost of government by, with, by paying the interest. After all bank currency is replaced by state currency, the economic conditions that most Americans believe exist today, that you thought, or most people thought, existed when you walked in that door, will actually exist. The ownership and control of the issuance of American currency being restored to the people rather than a private, secret, and I will add, criminal banking system. No longer positioned to use the franchise to print money out of the air to purchase influence with the people's elected officials. The political class will once again be dependent upon doing a good job for the people to keep their jobs rather than a corporate banker class that has unlimited funds. We don't know what they do with this money. We don't know how many different sets of books they have. We don't even really know how much money is out there. But we do know they own it and they'll use it for their purposes. When the swap over is complete, America will truly be back to the conditions George Washington described in his very well addressed, an equity-based economy in which the U.S. government only borrows for emergencies and then pays back what it borrows expeditiously. Here's the key. Donald Trump does not need Congress to do this. 
This is why they are deathly afraid of Donald Trump. This is why they don't want Donald Trump in there at all. Because all he has to do is do what he already has the authority to do. And that is to turn the U.S. Treasury on to paying the bills. That will cut off the bankers. This is very, very dangerous territory for a Donald Trump. And you know what? The guy seems fearless to me. I don't know. I don't, I, I've never seen anybody act like this, especially in the face of all that is against him. It's, it's astonishing to me that a man can stand, or one person can stand up against the powers that have been operating in control of this world as he is. And that's why I support the man. That's why I support the man. <laughs> the process Donald Trump described is the path to restore the original tent, intent of the Constitution. Unless we get our money back, then the destruction of the Constitution is all part of the destruction of our country. And it's all being paid for by money created in the air. So this is the first thing you've got to do in order to get the Congress to stay within its constitutional bounds. You've got to reclaim the money. I don't care what else Donald Trump might ever do, but if he just does this, then it at least set the stage for us to then become a constitutional republic once again. The process Donald Trump describes is exactly the way and the only way. This is the gatekeeper. This is the issue. This is the gatekeeper issue that will, if, if he can be successful, then he can also make America great again. So my, to answer the question, can Donald Trump pay off the national debt in eight years? Absolutely he can. It's just a matter of him doing it. That's all it is. That's why he said what he said. So, anybody got any questions? I am glad to take questions if anybody has any. Yes, sir. I got one. Uh you made the statement that the only way to pay the interest is to borrow more principal. Now, under our under present our situation, system. yes. Now, can we not? Can the government not pay the interest by raising taxes on us and causing us to pay more principal? Well, the reason why I said what I said is because whether the government taxes what we borrowed or borrows it directly, it's all borrowed funds. Okay. So, going back to 2008, when we had the crash, what they did is they authorized a higher printing of money. Is that where the bailout came from? They authorized the, the, to indebt the U.S. government by $800 billion and then to give that money ostensibly to pay off the toxic, ass, toxic, toxic assets of Wall Street. So what they did, this was the TARP, they, they put the American people in debt, guess to whom? To the banks, because <laughs> we had to borrow the money from the banks to then pay back to the banks. But the, the silly thing about that whole thing is they didn't have to do that. You saw, you saw what the Federal Reserve had been doing there. You saw the money printing slide there? Because they've been, yeah, QE. They've been printing money right and left without any kind of authority to indebt the American people. Well, what that does is it dilutes the value of the dollar. And also, it, it, it may not necessarily dilute, uh, 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 say, it, it, you can still buy a comquat for the same price, but there's less people working. It's taking the, the fuel to, to store, to, to create a vibrant economy out of the economy. That's how it's manifesting. And then a lot of that is deflation. So it, it may actually cost you less in certain instances to buy something now than it did at some time because of deflation. We're in a deflationary spiral here. And, but, but the cost is, the, is in the economy. One more thing. Okay. When the banks were foreclosing on all of us out here that had money. Exactly how did that all tie into this? Okay, this, that's a great question because it takes me into the area that, that as you realize when the banks are creating money out of the air, they're not at risk. Think about it. Now there have actually been cases where a bank printed money out of the air and they tried to take the asset that was secured by the funds. Well, the people 
went back and took him to court. Now, they could bankrupt you, take him to court on this, but they take him to court and they have to demonstrate, look, they weren't at risk in the first place, and the people win. The banks are not at risk in any of that. So the question that you, you asked, tell me the question again, real quick. I'm trying to figure out exactly what the relationship was between the banks coming in and taking our asset. Okay, they print the money out of the air, and if you don't pay it back, they get your stuff. That, that's the game. Yep, but no, 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 no. We were paying it back, and they came and got our stuff anyway. Which stuff in particular are you talking about? Our, I may be answering the wrong question. Well, we had a subdivision. We had been making payments on our subdivision right along, and all of a sudden they say, no, that's enough. Now we've got to have this much paid on it. Well, chances are, and I don't know this, it's the actual case, but chances are that the lender where you had borrowed the funds was not making their payments. Whether you're making your payments to them or not, they're not making their payments to, to whoever they owe. And so whoever they owe goes back. We, we, I, I don't really know the answer well, to that We owe straight to the bank, and we've been making payments on, yeah. our, on our subdivision all along. Mm -hmm. You know, I hadn't missed a payment. We were even ahead of schedule. All of a sudden, they say, yeah, we know you've been making those payments, but now we won't hundred thousand dollars today. Well, they call the loan. They call the loan. They call the loan. There's probably some fine print in there that allows them to call the loan. They want to keep the loan out there. Into this, so that's what I'm trying to get to. Oh well, they had a lack of liquidity, and so they had they 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 the banks had frozen up. Remember that that term? They froze up. Well, that's a lack of liquidity. When there's when everybody starts hoarding cash then nobody wants to part with any cash. And that's why they had, that's what TARP was supposed to do, QE is supposed to do, is supposed to instantly unfreeze things to keep things going. Well, your bank had frozen up. They couldn't make their debt payments. So what they were having to do is take back your property and then put it out there and, and forestall their, whoever their creditors were and say, okay, we took this property back, we're gonna sell it, so please just sit tight. But then uh, banks like Gainesville Bank and Trust, I don't know if that may have been who you were dealing with, but then they get bought by SunTrust. So, so it was a whole juxtaposition of financial institutions and, and at that time, uh, more institutions taking with their other institutions. We had a loan with SunTrust. They wouldn't even talk to us. We called them back, you know, okay, we need to renew this. What you, couldn't you get a phone call back? You know? They're, they just said, no, you know, you have to do something else. So we had to find other lenders. Yes, sir. One statement and one question. Uh, you are talking about the, the student loan debt. I heard them pronounce this week that it has now surpassed credit card debt. There you go. There you go. And, uh, the second thing is that the, the problem comes from the fact that Congress has advocated their authority to the Federal Reserve so that they can't be blamed when things are going wrong. They can say, well, it's not us, it's them. And that we're sitting there paying them to do a job and they're not doing their job. They're advocating that authority to somebody else. That's a great point. And I remember Rob Woodall talking about this one time. He made a speech. He was right on this. I'll give him credit when he's right on something. You know, most of the time he's just boo, boo, boo. But on this, this speech, um, he was talking about the creation of these governmental organizations. And the Congress will create these governmental uh, organizations and, and, uh, or non-governmental NGOs, non-governmental organizations like the Fed, and then place them beyond their reach to be able to affect them. They, they create them and they make them independent agencies. And then, and then they can say, ah, we have no power. It's like, what was that rule? Rule 21 that uh, Doug Collins kept yeah. invoking? Yeah. You know, they're saying, I'm sorry, Rule 21 says all this is mandatory spending over here. Well, change Rule 21. That's just, it's all part of it. You're exactly right. And, and, and that's, that is a game that they play in order to keep from being responsible for their own actions and to make it appear to the people that they're being responsible. Other questions? Yes, sir. I'm going back to my Econ 101 stuff. Forget it. <laughs> when I think of equity or asset-based, I think of something physical. Gold, land, whatever. Now, I'm, I'm thinking through this, and I'm looking at countries like China and India that are buying up the gold. You hear this in the news all the time. You look at the United States, and I hear nothing about buying up gold. Absolutely zip. 
And then I see that the, the, that the world banking system is looking to make the, the China's yen the, one of the world reserve currencies. The basket in the basket. Which is going to accelerate an exodus out of the dollar. My question comes about with, with this, this is a good constitutional argument. I can see that. But whether there's no assets behind either or, does it make a difference? Well, there are assets. The, the you know, asset, whether it's an asset or a liability, is a relationship between uh, the holder and, and who owns it. The holder may own it, in which case it's an asset. You know, that piece of paper, there is, if you own it, it's, it's an asset. But if you if someone else owns it, you have to pay it back. Then it's a liability. I understand. Okay, I, I so it, understand. it's not necessarily something tangible. It could be intellectual property. It but could it be anything. Gets, it gets down to that belief of is this a valuable thing? Yes. And people have always viewed gold and silver as valuable things. Well, sure. Whether it's a Federal Reserve note or it's a U.S. issued, you know, federal or government notes. It's still a belief on whether that's backed by something or not. It's a good point because the people have to have confidence in the currency. They have to have constant confidence that when they go to the store to buy the groceries, then the store is going to take it. But that confidence is really based upon an experience with it. Here, I, I think you're, you're probably hinting on whether a gold standard is a, I, I appropriate think or not. A whether we have a, a U.S. note or a Federal Reserve note, it's paper, and it might become worthless either way. Well, the difference is that the people don't have to pay back the U.S. notes. They stay in circulation, so they don't just disappear. They don't. You don't. You don't have a depression because of a lack of liquidity. I remember when I asked my mom because she she lived during the depression, and I said, "Mom, what was the depression like?" She said, "Son, nobody had any money." That's what it was. There was no liquidity. The only way they, they, they tried everything they could they, with all of the work programs and then finally World War II. They, they started printing money. And, and then you had the Weimar Republic and you had barrels of, of paper. Well, that was a different situation there too because they all they did was print money. And this is a controlled situation where, where the money circulates in the economy and you inject money in order to grow the economy. But, but you have to have real assets in the... What actually backs this are the goods and services of the economy. This, where, where you have a, a Weimar Republic and where the, nobody's, re, nobody's really producing anything, and they're, they're all looking, okay, where's the bread coming from? There's no bread. You know, well, I'll, I'll bid that up. I, I have, I, I've got more dollars than you, so that one piece of bread over there, I'll pay more for that than you can, and that's what causes something like that to happen. But the reason, the only reason why that I can tell that you need a gold standard, just to answer that question, is to keep dishonest bankers honest. Because other than that, that you never see the gold. Is there gold in, yeah, in Fort Knox? Who knows? I don't know. But even when we did have a gold standard, the only what got us out of that was that they were printing more money than the gold would support, and foreign countries were saying, oh, coming to the gold window, saying, okay, we want to redeem these dollars for. Uh, Thirty-five dollars for an ounce of gold. Well, they couldn't do that, and that's why Nixon had to decouple it. So we haven't had that ever since. But that unleashed the money printing. That's when the Federal Reserve started really printing money like it's going out of style, because we can't see their books. 1971. Yeah, was the decoupling of the, the gold. Yeah, that was 1971. Yeah. Yes, sir.
Yeah, and if you don't mind a little bit about it, maybe you can help. Yeah, it's funny. I look at you know Derek and Mary Kay just ran against Johnny Isaacson, and everybody's talking about all the established publications talking about. You know, Johnny Isaacson ran away with it. The way I look at it is that 23% of, of the people in the state of Georgia who vote are now awake. Well, if if each one of those tells one other person, then you got a real race there. So that's the way I look at it. And that's why, Steve, I know this is, it, it gets disheartening to, to come out and do this kind of stuff. But this is how... This is all we have to do. This is all we have. We all we can do is tell the people the truth, and then, and the rest is up to the people. I'll tell you, just like Derek, he he came out on his own one day. I don't know what what made him just some kind of fire went in his belly. I don't know, but the same thing happened to me. It's like I'm sitting at home and I got all this knowledge. I've been doing all this research. I know all this stuff, but it's like, what are you going to do? I'm sitting on my couch here. Well. Eventually, you got to do something. <laughs> Eventually, you just got to get out and start talking to people. Every opportunity that you have, and start beating, beating the, the bushes to find people to tell the truth to. Because, and and I'm not I'm not plugging Alex Jones, but it's truth that we are fighting an information war. The more people that we can get the truth to, the truth will set you free. It is all biblical, and if the American people understood what you now understand, oh my goodness, there would be... The biggest issue I see is the American population as a whole is the biggest apathetic group of people ever created. Until it gets them to where they realize that they have to do something, and hopefully that before it's too late, is when they'll start thinking and reacting. Until then, as long as they're able to get by and they're not getting too discomforted, they're going to let bygones be bygones and just keep flowing. But we're starting to get to the point more and more people are getting affected by it. That's why we're getting more and more people paying attention. The whole hard part is to get enough people to pay attention before it's too late. Well, before exactly. we reach that point that we can't make the problem there is that exactly they, right. they've dumbed down the education system. It's a calculated program. It's a full spectrum assault on anything that has to do with freedom. They're coming at us from every different area. I know you had a question. Yes, uh, the elected officials we have right now, um, do they know what they're supporting? Yes. You know, does uh, Doug Collins... I used to think no. But I've learned a few things from my friend Derek. Yeah. And now I'm to the point where, first of all, it doesn't matter if they know or not. It only matters to their maker if they know or not. But they're behaving as if they do not know. Yeah, but That's why they got to go. Yeah. But are they going up there and, you know, McConnell, you know, the powers, okay. they have their little meetings. And I'm convinced. Say, this is what we're doing, and we have to keep it this way because we can destroy America. Yeah, I'm convinced that those at the higher levels of leadership in Congress, they all know everything I just told you. And that's, that. now that you know this, now put... Put all of these uh, decisions of Congress and all these geopolitical events and everything that's going on around the world, sift those events through the prism of this new information and see if it doesn't start making sense. Like I said, Cuba. Why would he go to Cuba? Well, he's trying to open up a market for the Federal Reserve. That's all it is. We're, the system died in 2008. So they've got to create ways to get more and more currency out there so that we can, can pay the, the principal uh, pay the interest on the amount that's already out there. If Once you know that, then all of the geopolitical events that are going on take uh, open up a whole new avenue of understanding in that. Yes? Hey, how yeah. have you tied in the IMF with all of this? Because in studying Agenda 21 and the 26 principles that come out of ECOSOC from 1968, everything that we are dealing with, refugee settlement, Obamacare, uh, health care, all of it, all of it, the closures, the crisis, collapse, 
Yeah. The IMF is simply just a branch of the Federal Reserve System that is a marketing entity. It goes out and tries to indebt other countries to Federal Reserve currency. That's all that is. And so if the currency, like what happened in Ukraine, the Ukraine was a, was a State Department coup. The United States State Department, I've, done, I've got a whole uh, uh, program that I did on that, and I proved it. I mean, it they get, the evidence is right there. So they did that, and then what did they do? The IMF goes in there and says, oh gosh, we have to rebuild back your country. <laughs> So, so well, we'll we'll loan you seventeen billion dollars. That'll get you going here. Well, it's all at interest. It's all a game. That's all they're doing here. Syria is the same way. Assad does not. Assad has a sovereign banking system. He's not. He, in fact, he issued an edict that said that anyone caught using foreign currency, who he's talking about, is one of these Western bank, uh, central banking currencies, namely the Federal Reserve. Anyone use, using anything other than Syrian currency will be in prison for 10 years. See, this, it's all about that. It's all about the competing currencies. Derek. I just want to say one thing so that everybody understands. In this last election uh, that I ran against Johnny Isaacson, 25% of the people decided that they did not want Johnny Isaacson. They either were in tune with what he was doing, or Mary K. Bikey, y'all, and I touched them. Uh, it's 128,000 people. The other 75% of the people get their information from one of three sources, TV, radio, or print newspaper artic articles like uh, from Jim Galloway with the AJC. They're, they are the ones that go out and vote. So the only way we are going to beat the system is to overcome the media, which is our greatest enemy. The media refused to mention Mayor Gay Bacchial uh, in many articles, along with myself, and if they talked about me, it was something that they were trying to put out negative because we were turning the tide with those folks that we know. We know that we were a threat to the machine. So the, the job now is to find a way to overcome the press and either reach those 75% of Kool-Aid drinkers or get the people that have dropped out of the system and no longer participate, the apathetic that you were talking about, and convince them to vote. That is the only way that we can turn the tide because with the educational system that has dumbed down America and the media, which is, which is basically a de facto fourth branch of government that protects the incumbent. I think it was you or Mike that said it. Not a single incumbent lost in Georgia in this election, in this primary. Not a single one. Now, I had a guy come to me and tell me, man, I like everything that you said, but uh, I'm going to go with, you know, Johnny Isaacson, because, you know, I know him, and, and, and I said, you're a Kool-Aid drinker, and, and he got upset and was, was mad, and how can you support, hey, you know where I come from. I made, I made a similar, while you were out, I made a similar point, you just didn't hear it, that now we have, I, I was 23%, I said 20, I said, because of the, the efforts of Derek Grace and Mary Kay Bacchio, 23% of, of the people of Georgia are now awake. They would have had no reason to vote for one of you two guys unless, they, unless you had reached them in, with, a, with a message. So now they are awake. Now if those two, if that 23 talk to another 23, then we've got a game. Yes, sir. The problem is they don't know Johnny Isaacson. Yeah. Right. yeah. They you think know they, they know the name. Right. But that's, they don't know what he's voting. As I said, he's got an F minus no. voting on well, the that's, conservative That's why basis. I said that the press they is support. where they get their information. They come out and they the press protects incumbents. Absolutely. So if the press were to talk, if, if every media outlet in Georgia were to say, okay, we got three candidates running in the Republican primary, Johnny Isaacson, Mary Kay Bacchial, Derek Grayson, Go check out their website. 
But all the information that we put out uh, about what we stand for and Johnny's voting record, more people would not have voted for Isaacson, but they don't do that because they protect them. You the gotta get more banquets. You gotta get more banquets to invite the public them to buy oh, the press there. I'll say this. Remember the quote from Thomas Jefferson. He said, if the American people allow private banks to control the issuance of currency, the banks and corporations that grow up around will deprive the people of the property of their children grow. The banks and corporations, part of those corporations, the media. There you go. So it's all, it's amazing when you go back and, and, and hear what, look at what the founding fathers said. And, and they lived this. They understood exactly everything that we're having to re revisit and relearn. Did you have something, Mark? Yeah, I completely agree with Eric. I've called the AJC the last two and a half weeks to try to get someone to cover my presentation on the 16th. They have not returned any phone calls. They haven't returned any press releases that I've emailed them. Same thing with Fox 5 News. They haven't returned any phone calls the last two and a half weeks. Derek's exactly right. They control, because I'm really pushing the buttons on returning the religious freedoms. Because the they're in the they trough. They're, they're, in the, they're in the trough. Right. They're, they're in that trough. Did you have something, sir? Yeah. The one thing I agree with your statement for the most part, the majority of the people won't even go out and look. When they go into the polls, they're in there and they look down the list. Isaacson, I know that. And that's how they vote. They're not informed voters. They don't go out and try to research even if they wanted to or if they, somebody told them to. All they go out with is who can get their name out there the most, and that's the one they recognize. Sir, that's exactly that's what I just said. I was very interested. That's exactly what, what I just said. They get their information they do. from the name that is put forth from the media. And the only way to, we, we in this room have to find a way to either surgically go through the media and touch that 75% or get people that are not participating involved so that we can overcome the 75% who do go out and vote and keep re-electing the incumbents because of the information that they get from mainstream media. I think what you're doing is accomplishing that. Last time you ran, you got 1%. This time you ran, you got 12%. Look at that. That is significant. Because those, the, truly, that 23% of the people of the state of Georgia would have had no reason to vote for you unless you had reached that or Mary Kay, unless you would reach them. One, one way. So they are awake. Other than that, they would have just gone like everybody else and just pressed Isaacson. So I'm encouraged by all that. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say, you know, we mentioned spiritual truth. I think the church, if we can awaken the church of Jesus Christ. Can you give her the mic? I can't hear her. Repeat it. Just repeat it. If we can awaken the church of Jesus Christ. If we can awaken we can talk the church. She's talking about using the church as a tool. Lyndon Johnson well, fixed it where that can't happen with no, you, 501 no, can't, you can't, I get all kinds of mail. You can't endorse a candidate. You can have every candidate there speak. You can't endorse them. But you can talk about the role of government. You can talk about issues, homosexuality. And I think preachers are asleep. I think that's why we lost our country. And, that happened. and they're afraid. They're afraid of the 501c3. See, the only reason why we have a 501c3 is because of this system, this debt-based system, because they've got to control everything in order to enforce the system on the people. So here, why should a church even have to fill out the 501c3 paperwork? There, it says it in the United States Congress, in, in the United States Constitution, the First Amendment says freedom of the exercise of religion. Freedom. You don't have to sign up for freedom. You're free. So it's this system that's enforcing them to have to enter into it in order to, to use their money to pay for their light bill. Uh, I'm going to thank this young lady for saying this. I've been wanting to say something along this line. And I kind of feel like usually this kind of crowd is out of order. Uh, if you go back to the Old Testament, you had uh, the king, representative government, 
You had the priest who represented the faith community. Both of those were hereditary and were handed down through families. You had one person that stood in the lonely light of the call directly from God, and that was the prophet. The prophet's task was to preach or to, or to speak truth to power. Our churches have been swallowed by a big fish. Our pastors, I'm a retired pastor. Our pastors are afraid, not of the IRS. They're afraid to step out and be different. They're afraid of their deacons, their boards of whatever. And folks, the 75%, and you are a former pastor, I believe, or maybe still. Yes. That seventy-five percent, most of those are in churches. And in in height, what we're talking about is not a political issue, basically. It's a moral issue. It's a moral issue. Hank said the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I think in the context he said it, that's true. However, it's a half truth. In the half truth, there's a whole lie. If you go into Harvard University's campus, you'll see a plaque up there in the big brick wall. You shall know that no, no, it says the truth shall make you free. That's a lie. The truth is, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciple and the truth shall make you free. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, look Folks, at that. The, the sleeping giant right now is the church, and the reason is, is because pastors are no, uh, and I can go back to what happened in the 50s, and the 60s, and the 70s, so much has undermined the power of the Word of God. And the pastors don't know it, afraid to admit it. Isn't it the book of John that they, says that God is I, truth? And you want to give an invitation and take up an offer? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I'm trying to stay on the subject, and I think the subject of your seminar is the number one problem in the country right now. Is the debt-based monetary system. If we got rid of that and switched over, what would happen is that free press would rise up because all of these people are working to try to maintain the system that they get paid on. Yeah, they uh, got to please. I know her. I they got to please their customers is. rather than their benefactors. Right. Exactly. And you can't ever compete with with the TV station papers because and they won't let you. And they're all subject to antitrust. They all need to be broken up. All those media outlets need to be broken exactly up. Right. And I heard a woman on the radio one day, and uh, she said, you know what happened to this country? And the guy said, no what? And she said, our government has sold us out. They have sold us down the river. And they have. I put a candidate up in Barron County, a black female who was scared to death to go to the front door. Y'all met her. She ran against the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. I'm going to be talking about that if Steve lets me, uh, what this guy is doing to your money in this state. He's the guy who handles every penny of the money in your state. He's the guy for blowing all the money. He's the guy for, for throwing the money away so that you have to have a tax increase for roads. There was plenty of money in our government to pay for the roads. But for this guy who's head of the House Appropriations Committee. By the way, the Constitution requires anything to go through him. But that's why he has such a stranglehold in the state. Anyway, I paid for virtually the entire campaign. I only only sent out one mailing, and that was for uh, the Winder section of Barra County. I paid for a lot of radio ads. Uh, if she knocked on 50 doors, it would be a miracle because she was scared to death to go walk, knock on the door in the white neighborhood. She only got 10% of the vote. But her opponent spent over $50,000 beating her and had to bring the governor in 
to reinforce his election. The, the margin would have been a lot thinner if the governor had shown up. So here's the moral of that story. It takes the money, but y'all scatter your money all around everywhere. You like and complain, but you don't ever put any money. I challenge you that if Steve will do this, and we can find a committee chairman within a 50 mile radius of where I live, I'll put up a substantial amount of money for the campaign if you put up the rest of it. We'll take out one of these committee chairmen. We're going to vet them before we start. They're going to be against them. Refugee resettlement, they're going to be against the budget, and they're going to be for religious freedom and for the gun bill. And I don't know, we may put a lot few more wrinkles in there. But if you people are serious about this, and you've got to pool your money, I'll put in my share, and we'll get something done. But D.A. King has a saying about the Tea Party it's a mile wide and an inch deep. You keep that up, you'll never accomplish anything. Yep. Agreed. Anybody else? Nothing else? I'll turn it back over to Steve to wrap it up then. Just give him a hand. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, come to the end of the show. You want to wait till next month and give a full presentation? You'll have a better crowd. I mean, some people have already left. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want to thank you for being here, for one. But as he said, um, you know, all politics is local. That's where we began right here. And we've got, you know, Gwinnett, I grew up in Gwinnett County. I'm from Beaufort, Georgia originally. So I'm a native here, and I have seen this county turn into a cesspool because of developers and commissioners who have given them the right to build on a quarter acre or a tenth of an acre or whatever the case is. There are houses everywhere where it used to be beautiful meadows and horses running and things like that. We've got garbage here now. So it's, it's sad to me to see what my county has turned into. But until we get the guts, as he said, to, to work together to replace commissioners, to replace state representatives and things like that, we're going to have the same problem. It's not going to change. So we have got to stick together in every way we can. We used to have this place packed all the way back to the doors and sometimes past there when we would invite politicians here to speak. They wanted to rub, hand, or rub I guess, elbows with the politicians. And these guys are the three, they're your enemy. They're the worst people you know. And I honestly believe on your question that when they are brought to Washington, if they get that far, they are told, you will either do this or we're going to throw you out of the club. And we've got a great country club here that's the best in the world. It's the most secure in the world, and we will make you completely wealthy and independent of all these people, and you will govern these people eventually. They will be your slaves. That's what the plan is. So I don't know what to say at this point except God bless you. God bless America. Drive safely home. Thank you very much. <laughs>